It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I would like to ask a question today from Global's Alan Carter, a.k.a. Queen's Park's very own anchorman. I ask because he couldn't get a straight answer from this government last week during the budget scrum. He asked, if you drive a car, heat your home with natural gas, you are going to pay more. Correct. There will be less money for people at home. Correct. There will be less money in their pocket at the end of the day. Mr. Speaker, Deputy is, this, House Leader. is this correct? Does this budget mean less money for families at the end of the day? We believe Alan deserved an answer. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about. Um, <laughs> well, and I think Alan, I think Alan's perfectly capable of asking his own questions. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, let me just talk about what is in this budget that is is supporting people, Mr. Speaker. Quite frankly, there are enormous supports. I was just at a, uh, I was at a high school this morning at Jarvis Collegiate, Mr. Speaker, and we talked about uh, the the reality that. Students who live in families who uh, are low income, right through to middle income, Mr. Speaker, are going to get more support for tuition. They're going to have more access to post-secondary, Mr. Speaker. So that transformation of student assistance, free tuition for low-income families, and uh, more affordable tuition for middle-class families, Mr. Speaker, that's incredibly important across the province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are continuing to lower auto insurance rates. We are eliminating the $30 drive clean emissions fee, Mr. Speaker. We're lowering hospital parking fees for approximately 900,000 patients and visitors, Mr. Speaker. In Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. If the tax increases weren't enough, this budget increases fees on virtually every government service fee. Fees for driver and vehicle licensing are going up. Camping in provincial parks, fishing and hunting licenses just got more expensive. Everything from liquor license, licenses to event permits for charity fundraisers will cost people more. And the kicker is not a one-time increase. Fees will go up every year under this Liberal government. Wow. Mr. Speaker, is there not a single person, family, charity or business that you won't take more money from to pay for your years of waste and mismanagement? Thank you. I, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not enamored by some of the comments I'm hearing, and so I'm going to start ratcheting up my, uh, <clears throat> my role here, if it's, if it's necessary. Uh, please keep those comments uh, civil. Premier. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it is um, it is quite something, and I, I know that the leader of the, thir of the opposition might not uh, be aware of this, but for many years, uh, his party. Uh, was very adamant that we should look at the Drummond report, that we should look at yep. what Don Drummond yeah, said to us to about say. good government, what Mr. Speaker, Drummond? responsible fiscal management, yeah. and uh, you know we continue to implement uh, many of the recommendations that Don Drummond gave us. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I, you know he might uh, he might want to check with yeah. his colleagues about that. But let me go through again, Mr. Speaker, the changes that we are making that are going to support families in this province. I talked about free tuition, free uh, the tuition. biggest the biggest investment in That's infrastructure in Ontario's history, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. We're in the third year of our $160 billion investment, Mr. Speaker. That creates 110,000 jobs a year, Mr. Speaker. And surely the leader of the opposition would agree that Answer. having a job is a pretty important part of having a high-quality life in the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. There is no one in the province that won't pay more because of your mistakes because of liberal mistakes. If you drive a car, you'll pay more. If you heat your home with gas, you'll pay more. If you camp, fish, or hunt, you'll pay more. If you are a senior with medication, Minister you'll pay more. Resources. If you're a charity hosting, you'll pay more. Excuse me, stop the clock. Um, the moment I say come to order, you continue. Don't go for two. Please. Mr. Speaker, fundamentally, this budget makes life more expensive for everyone in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, what has happened to this Premier's compassion? Why is she making life so much harder for everyone in Ontario? 
Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again, uh, let me just let me just reinforce what I have said already: that there are many ways in this budget that we are supporting and lowering costs for families. So, seniors between the ages of 65 and 70 will be able to get. Uh, 65 and 70. That's what I said. Oh, I yeah. 65 and 70. We'll be able to get uh, the shingles virus for free, Mr. vaccine for free, Mr. Speaker. Um, we're dedicating $100 million to help 37,000 homeowners conduct audits, Mr. Speaker, in order to reduce their energy bills. Yeah. As I said, we're eliminating the $30 uh, dollar drive clean emissions fee, Mr. Speaker. We're providing $650,000 in matching funding with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce to support an innovative program for high school students that will help them with financial literacy education. And Mr. Fantastic. Speaker, the Auditor General noted in 2009 that Ontario's fee service fees per capita are among the lowest in Canada, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. That's the reality. That's what Thank we're dealing you. with. We continue to support families in the province, Mr. Speaker. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. This government has no credibility in Northern Ontario. The Liberals say they value Northern Ontario, but not once did the Minister of Finance mention the North, Northern Ontario or the Ring of Fire during his actual budget speech. This is the third straight budget that in the budget fine print they have re-announced funding for the Ring of Fire. It's a re-announcement of a re-announcement. But despite three years of these announcements, there is not a shovel in the ground or a single dollar spent. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier stop paying lip service to Northern Ontario? Will she finally invest in the Ring of Fire? Will she finally stand up and invest in Northern Ontario? You say that, please. You say that, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, I believe that the uh, that the uh, students who live in Northern Ontario will be able to access uh, yes, free tuition, Mr. Speaker, as easily as students who live in Southern Ontario. Mr. Speaker. Let me talk, Mr. Speaker, about the uh, $550 million in Northern infrastructure through the Northern Highways Program. Four -lane of Highway 69 south of Sudbury and Highway 1117 east of Thunder Bay, rehabilitation of the Noden Causeway near Fort Francis, resurfacing of 36 kilometres of Highway 144, replacement of the Valentine River Bridge, Mr. Speaker. Let me talk about the $300 million a year to support projects in rural and northern communities through the Ontario— No, don't encourage anyone else. You have a 10-second wrap-up, please. Through the Ontario um, Communities Infrastructure Fund, Mr. Speaker, for rural and northern communities. Thank you. Supplementary. Time. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The only news the government is making in northern Ontario is their Sudbury by-election scandal. That's right. You know, this, this budget ignores the importance of the North. Let me quote Nathan Lawrence, the president of the Northwestern Ontario Association Chambers of Commerce, when he told the pre-budget hearings that there is a significant component of our northern region that is inaccessible through transportation, through electricity, and other means of infrastructure. For a government that can't say a sentence without mentioning their commitment for infrastructure, the, develop, the, the development of northern infrastructure seems to be missing from this budget. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals already cut part of the north when the Nipigon Bridge failed. Is there lack of funding a plan to cut off northern Ontario? Will you support northern infrastructure? Question. Yes or no? The Leader of the Opposition's question is ridiculous. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, the investments we're making in infrastructure are across the province. I just talked about $550 million in northern infrastructure. You don't know when I'm going to call you to attention when I'm asking for quiet. Please finish, Premier. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I think that the Leader of the Opposition could talk to the folks at the Atacocan General Hospital, ah, Mr. Speaker, where the renovation of the acute and long-term care beds are, is taking place. He could talk to the folks at the Alexander Henry High School in Sault Ste. Marie, yeah, where $8 million is going to retrofit that school, Grenville. Mr. Speaker. He could talk, about, talk to the folks at Confederation College in Thunder Bay, where a new technology, education and collaboration hub is happening. He could talk, Mr. Speaker, to the, the, uh, six, to the people who are involved in the 6,900 56 projects that have been supported by a, hunt, a billion dollars through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, Mr. Speaker. He could have a conversation with all of those folks and understand the investments that this Thank government you. has made in Northern infrastructure. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm standing. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the question the Premier called ridiculous was actually a quote from the Northwestern Ontario Association of Chambers of Commerce. That's nice, that's nice, but that's the way you treat Northern Ontario. You know, you can dismiss Northern Ontario, you can dismiss their concerns, but the reality is, look at the pre-budget hearings. Your finance minister may not want to pay attention to the pre-budget hearings, but you should pay attention. No. New Liskert in the pre-budget hearings reported that they had to close their operating room for 50% of the time because only one in 10 of their staff got cut. Timmins was forced to cut 26 beds, close their physio, and fire 40 staff. And in the Sioux, they had to cut 50 beds in acute and complex care. That being said, there is nothing in this budget for Question. Northern Ontario except for reduced health care and a higher cost of living. Mr. Speaker, why has this Premier Thank continued you. to again and again Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I was not in any way commenting on the remarks of people from the North, Mr. Speaker. I was. No. Uh, Minister of Energy. Please finish. I was challenging the premise. I was challenging the premise of the question from the leader of the opposition, opposition, Mr. Speaker. This is a member who sat in the Harper government for nine years, Mr. Speaker. We've had a billion dollars. Thank you. New question. Member from Marmilly Gordon. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. It sounds like the Premier realized her plan to make most seniors pay more for medication was a mistake. Will the Premier acknowledge that we should be expanding prescription drug coverage and protecting universal access to health care, not cutting back the coverage that seniors need? Thank you, Premier. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, the member opposite knows perfectly well that. The member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington will come to order, and the member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. The changes that we have made, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the Ontario drug benefit were intended and will increase support for 170,000 seniors, Mr. Speaker, who will now not have to pay any deductible for their uh, prescription drugs, Mr. Speaker. That's 170,000 seniors who will have more support and will have more access. That was the intention. That is what will happen as a result of the changes that we're making. Mr. Speaker, I acknowledged yesterday that as the regulation is out for consultation now in terms of the threshold for 
the uh, the seniors who will be asked to pay a bit more on their deductible. That consultation is out, and if we can uh, if we can come to uh, an That's agreement her. on uh, that that threshold should be changed, we're open to doing that, Mr. Here, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. A senior in Ontario living on. $19,500 will see their drug costs nearly double under this Liberal budget. Yesterday, the Premier said, and I quote, if we didn't get it right, then we will make a change, like she just said earlier. Will the Premier admit today that if she didn't get it right, she will commit today to changing it? Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Health wants to weigh in on this, but I just want to make it clear what's happening here. The the, lead, the third party came to a conclusion. I came to the same conclusion. The third party said, this is what we think should happen. I said, I've reached that conclusion. I agree with you. We should be open to making this change. Now they are saying, are you going to do this? I said this, Mr. Speaker. I said it yesterday. I said that we were going to have the regulation out for consultation. We're open to making a change, Mr. Speaker. I would suggest that they're having a hard time taking yes for an answer, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the issue is about these consultations. Listen, the Premier shouldn't need another series of consultations to figure out that doubling drug costs for seniors living on $19,500 is not right. Will the Premier commit today and admit that she was wrong and cancel her plan to double drug costs for most seniors in this province? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Quite frankly, I can't understand why the member opposite can't take yes for an answer, Mr. Speaker. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, come to order. The member from Eglinton Lawrence, come to order. Uh, the member will get a second time if he continues to speak while I first get him to pay attention and second speak while I'm speak standing. Finish, please. But, Mr. Speaker, I can't understand why the member opposite is not interested in the fact that 170,000 more low-income seniors are going to pay no drug costs yeah, on right. an annual basis, that's and 30,000 more each and every that's year. Right. And the member opposite hasn't acknowledged that our out-of-pocket drug costs for seniors in this province are by far the lowest in the entire country. Yeah. In fact, our average out-of-pocket drug costs for seniors are $277 a year, Mr. Speaker. Answer. The next close pro closest province, Mr. Speaker, is over $600. Yeah. There are provinces that are over $1,000, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, no, Mr. No questions. Yes. Thank you. The question is now to the Premier again. Yesterday, the Premier said that she needed more consultation to figure out if it was the wrong decision to nearly double the drug costs for seniors living on $19,500. Well, it's clear. I can tell you the answer. That's the wrong decision. You don't need a consultation to tell you that. Anyone who doesn't get that is out of touch with the reality that most people and most seniors face. Will the Premier commit today? to cancel her plan to double the medication costs for most seniors living in Ontario. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows that we're not planning to double the costs to our seniors, but we've indicated the Premier has been crystal clear in terms of, as we put this forward for consultation, as we draw in an additional 170,000 of the lowest income seniors who will no longer have to pay any annual deductible, as we post that for consultations, the regulation, we will look at all seniors and how it impacts them. The Premier is very open to having that conversation. I would hope that the member opposite would be part of that conversation as we determine what's best for our seniors, but I'm disappointed that he refuses to to acknowledge that those 170,000 of the poorest of the poor seniors will no under our plan will no longer have to pay any annual deductible, Mr. Speaker. Right. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Mr. Speaker, ensuring that seniors can afford medication means keeping seniors healthy. It means less time in the hospital and more time for seniors to enjoy what they've earned. And it also means fewer worries house leader, about second time. how they'll pay those bills. Will the Premier again commit today that come this summer, seniors will be able to afford their medication costs? 
Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me talk about some of the other things that we're doing for our seniors in this budget. For example, the additional $250 million that we're investing in home and community care That's to benefit fantastic. our seniors. The $75 million over the next three years in community-based residential hospice and palliative care. We've heard nothing about that from the, the member opposite or his party, Mr. Speaker. The 170,000 more seniors that will pay no annual deductible. The shingles vaccine provided yep. free of charge. $170 value to each and every senior between the age of 65 and 70. We're removing the debt retirement charge, Mr. Speaker, which will yep. save seniors on average $70 a year. $10 million new in behavioral supports for seniors in long-term care homes that are suffering from dementia. $10 million more yes, dollars to support those individuals. Yeah. The list is long. I'm happy to talk further in the final supplement. Thank you. <coughs> final supplementary. Speaker, doubling the cost for medication for most seniors in this province is a huge mistake. And I hope the Premier understands that. She shouldn't need yet another consultation to tell her what everybody already knows. That doubling the drug costs for seniors without consultation, without warning, without even asking them was a mistake. Will the Premier ensure that Ontarians won't have to pay for her mistake? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the member knows that, that our drug program hasn't been updated in 20 years. Yeah. So we decided that we would actually bring 170,000 more of the lowest yeah. income yeah. seniors yeah. into the category which allows them to pay no annual deductible at all, to go from $100 do deductible annually down to zero dollars. Yeah. I would hope that the member, I would hope at least that the old NDP would have supported that kind of measure. The new NDP has chosen not to reference that whatsoever. Yeah. It's not a doubling that we proposed. It's increasing that, that deductible from $100 to $170, but the Premier has been absolutely crystal clear. She's willing to work with the opposition party. You've come up with no suggestions. I know you want to spend more and more and more money. We have an incredible drug program in this province. We need to make sure that we get it right for all seniors. That's the commitment Answer. that our Premier and this government makes. We'll do that as we go forward with consultations. Thank you. No question. The member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, we're now seeing the effects of your government bringing forth a budget without proper consultation. Seniors were shocked to hear that on top of higher hydro rates and driver license fees that the prescription drug costs will double. Three quarters of Ontario seniors will be affected by this drug cost increase. However, seniors were not consulted. In fact, even the Ontario Pharmacists Association was taken aback by this decision. Premier, consultation should take place before the budget is released. This totally exemplifies your government's total mismanagement of our province. Premier, could you have not taken the time and sat down and consulted with seniors prior to this budget release? Well, Mr. Speaker, I have to uh, repeat that 170,000 of the lowest yeah. income seniors in this right. province are going to be joining, I think, approximately 300,000 that already pay no annual deductible yeah. because You're they can't afford to, right? Mr. Speaker. And so we're going to have almost half a million of the seniors in this province that will pay that co-payment of $2 or less because many pharmacists will waive that cost. Yeah. I and they will pay no annual deductible. It'll go from $100 yeah. down to $0. Zero. I think even a party such as the Conservative Party, I would hope that even they would support that measure, <laughs> that measure, Mr. Speaker. I would hope that the NDP party would support that measure where we're providing significant support to those who need it most. Yes, sir. As we go forward, we've committed to looking to see how it impacts all seniors, and we're open to good suggestions, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplement. Speaker, back to the Premier. Premier, you should have looked at how the impact is going to be on all seniors prior to going forward with this budget. Premier, your government and Ministry of Finance, Minister of Finance, was quick to release this budget. So quick that you forgot to include Ontarians in consultations. Oh, our seniors, who are most are the vulnerable of our society, should have a say what's happening in our province. I would have thought your government would have learned to consult after they embarrassed themselves over the smoking of medical marijuana just a few months ago. Yeah. Yesterday you said you'd like to get it right for seniors. Why didn't you properly consult with seniors before the budget release? Premier, you're making life unaffordable for seniors. Seniors now will pay more for energy. 
Seniors cannot access long-term care beds. Seniors will pay double for their prescription costs, and seniors still cannot get their knee or hips replaced in January, February, and March Question. of each and every year. Premier, why are you failing seniors? Wow. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, it begs repeating the measures that we've announced in this year's budget that will benefit our seniors. I didn't get an opportunity when I was providing that list to the NDP to reference as well the additional investments we're making in long-term care. A 2 percent increase, Mr. Yeah, Speaker, uh, over the next three years. Uh, we made a decision, of course, and it was referenced in the budget, the measures that we're taking on hospital parking, which will benefit our seniors across this yeah, province sure to in increase and improve accessibility when they go either as patients or to visit their loved ones. We're increasing our social assistance rates, Mr. Speaker. We're providing the shingle vaccine free of charge. We're expanding, uh, as I've mentioned, I don't know how many times I have to mention it before I get a positive response, 170,000 170, more seniors are going to benefit. And we're already in an environment where Ontario, by far, by a long shot, is more generous Thank than you. any other province or jurisdiction in Canada. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelback. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, patients and their families were hopeful with this year's budget, and so was I. But a, second, a seven straight years of squeezing hospital with base funding below inflation will not undo the damage the Liberals have done to health care in Ontario. Page 116 of the budget says, and I quote, in 2016-17, the government is increasing its base funding for hospital by 1%. That's less than inflation. 1%, Speaker, is the status quo. It means that the 1,200 nurses that have lost their job won't get their job back. It means that the long wait list will continue. It means that hospital will be forced to continue to cut programs and services and jobs. Why did this Liberal government choose to make life harder? For patients in Ontario. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mr. Speaker. And um, so a one percent increase to the hospital line works out to about 150 million dollars. And the member knows that in this budget we're increasing the hospital line by 345 million dollars. That's more than two percent. That's more than the CPI or the rate of inflation, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. It's a substantial increase. And I wish I had the quote in front of me from Anthony Dale from the Ontario yeah, Hospital yeah, Association. Very, very but very when I was with him yesterday morning at University Health Network with a whole host of patients, their advocates, health care workers, health care professionals from uh, that part of uh, Toronto, Mr. Speaker, they applauded the substantial investment of $345 million and the difference that it would make to patient care, the difference that it would make to our hospitals, Answer. and it was applauded enthusiastically by the head of the Ontario Hospital Association. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, at St. Joe's Healthcare in Hamilton, they say the Liberals' budget is not going to change anything. They still have to cut $26 million. They still have to lay off 136 workers. Family and frontline workers know better than what you're trying to tell to us, to say to us. Patients are suffering with the government cut. Nurses are being laid off in Windsor, Hamilton, Waterloo, right across the province. Beds have been closed in North Bay and Timmins. Hospitals in Thunder Bay and across the province are so full that they are forced to open beds in hallways and patient lounge, and none of this get paid for. When will the Minister of Health realize that liberal cuts to health care are hurting patients? Thank you. Minister well, of it, it, um it boggles the mind, Mr. Speaker, to understand how a billion-dollar increase in the health care budget this year yeah. going forward, how that could be characterized by the third party somehow as being a decrease. Yeah. A, billion a billion dollars more dollars. in new funding, $345 million of that going specifically to the hospital line of the budget. But we're doing much more, $12 billion over the next 10 years to build and improve existing hospitals, to build new yeah. hospitals and renovate existing ones. Yeah. And in fact, that fund that we have annually that helps hospitals with maintenance and renovations, we're increasing that by an additional $50 million. Yeah. We're investing
investing $85 million in our nurses through our nurse practitioners in our community health centres, yeah, in our family good. health yeah, teams, which is which <laughs> hopefully they would support that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, $75 Answer. million dollars as well to fund 20 more hospices, to increase our funding That's to hospices. There are so many positive investments for our health care system. I don't understand how that could possibly add up to anything but good news. The member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Our health care budget is increasing every year, and in the 2016 budget, you see this confirmed. We see an increase of a billion dollars this year to a total of $51.8 billion. In my riding of Kitchener Centre and in Greater Waterloo Region, I recently met with hospital CEOs, Lynn representatives and doctors, who are very pleased to see increases in our local funding. As our population ages, we need to ensure that our system is ready to care for our seniors. With health equity as a top priority in the Minister's Patients First Action Plan, it is very important to address health care for our most vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please tell this House what the government is doing to support Ontarians through health care investments? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, at risk, of, at risk of repeating myself, but let me start with a couple of quotes from uh, individuals who I think, as it pertains our, to our hospitals, have a tremendous amount of credibility. Anthony Dale, who's the president and the CEO of the Ontario Hospital Association, his quote about our budget, today's investment will go to support frontline care and help to keep wait times low, maintain access to elective surgery, and ensure that important health service programs are maintained. Or, Mr. Speaker, if that's not enough, the Council of Academic Hospitals yeah. of Ontario. So all those hospitals across the province, the teaching hospitals that do such great teaching and research, Mr. Speaker, the Council of Academic Hospitals of Ontario welcomes the commitments in the 2016 Ontario budget for an investment in Ontario's hospitals and its overall focus on fostering innovation and building prosperity. But we know it's much more than just our hospitals. It's also that transformation that we're taking. Thank you. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his response. I know in particular that at St. Mary's Hospital, in my riding of Kitchener Centre, that the staff and the management there were very happy to learn about the investment. But we know that health care extends beyond hospitals, and that's why our government is continuing to increase funding for home and community care by $250 million this year. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a few years ago when my mother had surgery for breast cancer, she was very anxious to leave the hospital to go home where she wanted to recover, and she was able to do so with excellent CCAC care that followed. I sat on the pre-budget consultations. We toured the province, and there were repeated calls for expansion to hospice care. And now we're doubling our investment in community-based hospice and palliative care to $155 million over three years. Speaker, can Question. the minister please tell this House what the government is doing to make life easier for those who need end-of-life care? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of the investment that we're making in palliative care and end-of-life care. It's an investment we're, we're augmenting. We're putting in an additional $75 million for a total of $155 million over the next three years. And it's in response to what is such an appropriate measure to take and appropriate support to provide uh, individuals and their loved ones at that very difficult and challenging part of anyone's life. But, and it's resulted, I think, in response, even from members of this legislature, although they, of course, if they're in the opposition, they would refrain from saying it here. But let me quote uh, the member from, uh, so Vic Fideli, I'm sorry, the member from Nipissing. I apologize for saying his name. For the member from Nipissing, I was really pleased to see the hospice money come through. We have a hospice in North Bay, and it's such a huge need. Answer. When I saw that, I thought that was excellent. And the autism money. I sat in my office when I meet with constituents and they're just at the end of the road, and so those two initiatives, I thought, were well Thank announced. You. These are the types of things. Thank you. New question, the member from the Queen's Park. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Last week's budget was her government's ninth straight deficit. They have more than doubled the debt. We have a larger debt than all other provinces combined. We have the largest subnational debt in the entire world. Forcing their government to the
If you don't respond, it makes it easier for me to get there. Thank you. Finish, please. They've made the servicing the debt and the deficit the third largest spending priority of their government. That puts our future generations at risk. I said that last week. It takes money intended for health care and education and, and gives it toward paying off the debt. You don't have to take my word for it. Even the Toronto Star said this past week, quote, the Liberal plan leaves Ontario's poorest children behind. Not only is this budget a fiscal train wreck, it makes life more difficult for everyday families. Associate Minister and for of Finance. Middle class families, it's just as bad. They are taking money, namely Question. for the Children's Activity Tax Credit that helps moms and dads give their kids a hands up. So I would like to know why this government is trying to take that Thank away you. and making it a bigger burden for mothers and fathers. Oh, Mr. Speaker. Um, as usual, it's difficult uh, because there's no consistency coming from uh, from the opposition. So I'm not quite sure whether they think we should be spending more, whether we should be spending less. We've got a we've got a credible plan, Mr. Speaker, to eliminate the deficit. But at the same time, we know that investing in people is important, and that's why the uh, that's why the free tuition, the changes to student assistance, Mr. Speaker, are so very important for families across the uh, province, particularly low-income and middle-income families, Mr. Speaker. Um, we we, we've been very clear in terms of changes on the tax credits. We were going to look at every line in our spending, Mr. Speaker. Yep. We were going to make decisions based on the evidence. So if you look at the Children's Activity Tax Credit, it was not serving its intended purpose. Its intended Remember purpose from Bruce was to assist so. lower income families with enrollment costs. That's not what it was doing, Mr. Speaker. So we changed that, and we're, and going, to, uh, we're going to continue to make those kinds of decisions that reinvest and deliver the outcomes that Thank we you. know people need. Thank you. Supplementary. If the Premier wants to talk about consistency, she has to look at the last nine budgets her government tabled and see a massive deficit yeah. and an even bigger debt that has made Ontario a basket case financially. The Children's Activity Tax Credit is useful to a lot of mothers and fathers I represent in Riverside South and in Barhaven. They apply it to their children's piano lessons, to hockey fees, even to help them tutor as, uh, as, as their ch children's progress, sometimes making an otherwise unaffordable activity accessible to that family. Even Dalton McGinty, when he brought in the single largest sales tax increase in Ontario's history, the HST, brought in the tax credit and said, quote, it is one more way we can help parents pay for those costs associated with raising healthy, Question. active kids. And now you're going to cut it when you bring in the single largest gas tax increase in Ontario's history. What have you got against the next generation? Oh, thank you. I think, I think generation, my Mr. Mr. Speaker, I want the next generation to be at its very best. That's why we are making dramatic changes to the uh, to student assistance in this province, Mr. Speaker. But you know, the, the member opposite doesn't get to say spend more and spend less at the same time. You just don't get to have it both. Premier. We promised the people of Ontario that we were going to go through all of the expenditures in uh, government and we were going to look at what was working and what wasn't. So if you look, for example, at the Health Homes Renovation Tax Credit, what has happened is that that credit has had significantly lower, than, uh, than, lower, lower take up than we had anticipated, Mr. Speaker, and doesn't provide support to low income seniors. That's what it was intended to do, Mr. Speaker. That's not what it does. So we're not going to continue with that. The Research and Development Tax Credit, we're actually reinvesting the savings yes, from those tax changes into new targeted investments. So, Mr. Speaker, we've made decisions based on evidence so second that we can time. get the outcomes that we know are needed, whether it's for seniors or low-income families who need support for two Thank you. New question, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Last, week, last week's budget clearly indicates that the government isn't spending $430 million already allocated for education. The minister claims that this is not a cut to education. Well, Speaker, Ontario families know that less money spent on education amounts to a cut, and cuts always drastically impact our most vulnerable students. The result? 
schools in Belleville, Milton and London that provide specialized supports to some of our most vulnerable students with exceptional learning and developmental needs may be forced to close. Speaker, on this side of the House, we believe all children deserve equal access to education. Why is this Minister of Education making life harder for our most vulnerable students? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, so a couple of different issues getting mixed about here. Let's talk a little bit about provincial schools for a minute, and then we'll go back to the whole issue of cuts. Number one, there is no change in funding in, the, in this budget that we've made to provincial schools. But what we have discovered when we look at the data is that some of the provincial schools, Speaker, have very low enrollment. Some, like the uh, provincial school for the blind in, in uh, your hometown of Brantford, has a lot of students. Uh, the uh, schools in uh, Milton, the schools in Belleville for the deaf, have quite healthy enrollment. But we have other provincial schools where there's only 11 children left in attendance. We have another provincial school where there's only 19, and the projections for next year are either low well, at that point, we have a responsibility to look at the programs and figure out how we can best deliver programs for the sake of the children. Thank you. Got nothing to do with money. Exactly. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Against the minister, the minister should know that decreased enrollment does not mean decreased needs. Ontario families are tired of hearing this government scapegoating their underfunding of education while our most vulnerable students pay the price. This government is taking real dollars out of education and real kids are being impacted. The potential closure of provincial demonstration schools for students with severe learning disabilities, as well as schools for the deaf, means our most vulnerable kids will be left with few options to gain equal access to an education. Oh, wow. We've received emails and phone calls from children with unique needs. They are begging this government to not close institutions designed to help them succeed. Will the minister finally admit that pulling $430 million from education is not in the best interest Question. of students? Thank you. Minister. Well, in fact, Speaker, we haven't pulled for 130 minutes out of uh, education funding. If you look at our funding, we have increased funding by uh, $8.1 billion, and that continues to be true. The budget, in fact, if you look at the budget documents, we will, you will find, Speaker, that the increase in the budget in my ministry has been 1.2 per cent on average each and every year. That's what the budget document says. That will continue to be the case. We are increasing the funding for education. For example, she's trying to tell us that we cut the money last year for schools. Do you know what we did in this year in which we cut money, according to her? Answer. We spent $498 million for 30 new schools and for 26 Thank additions you. and renovations. Thank you. New question. The member from Mississauga, Brampton South. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Our government's 2016 budget committed to update the long-term affordable housing strategy, the details of which will be shared in coming weeks. There is a commitment for new funding to support our goal to end homelessness in 10 years. And there is also significant investment in supportive housing to help Ontarians with mental health, medical, and accessibility needs to live independently and with dignity. It is my understanding that the minister will develop a new portable housing benefit, which will transform the social housing system. Question. Will the minister explain what this new benefit is and how it will improve social housing system for Thank you. my constituents. Sir, Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I'm uh, tremendously excited about the infusion of $178 million in, in new funding in the budget uh, to support uh, housing subsidies and supports. Regarding the portable housing benefit, the member is right. 
once developed, this benefit could have a huge impact in improving the efficiency of social housing in Ontario. At present, Ontarians in need of housing assistance rely on various programs across the province, but this assistance is usually tied to a particular unit. Uh, through a portable housing benefit, support funds would be tied to an eligible household and not to a specific housing unit. This means that when a person moves, the benefits would move with them. Mr. Speaker, Member from this Kitchener, will be Waterloo. More, more consistent Answer. support and more choice for people in need, as well as more flexibility for those who deliver social and affordable Thank you. housing. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know constituents in Mississauga, Brampton South, who rely on housing assistance, as well as our municipal partners, will appreciate this modern, cost-effective way to address the province's affordable housing challenge. I have read in the budget that our government has also committed to run a pilot project that will provide this portable housing benefit to those who flee domestic violence. It is a priority for our government that women in Ontario feel safe in their homes and throughout their communities. Through you, Mr. Speaker, will the minister share with this House how this model of housing assistance will help survivors of domestic violence? Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, uh, violence uh, against women is a serious problem they cannot and will not be tolerated in Ontario. No, we're not. <laughs> That's why this gov our government is taking this action, building on existing efforts to combat gender-based violence. <clears throat> As coordinated by the minister responsible for women's issues, thank you, our government will invest $2.4 million this year in a pilot version of this new portable housing benefit that will focus on those fleeing domestic violence. Speaker, we know that these survivors have an acute need for emergency housing. In providing this benefit to sur survivors, we're empowering them to make safe living choices with peace of mind that their housing assistance will travel Answer. with them wherever they need to go. This is a good step forward, one we're proud of, one we're going to pilot, we're going to evaluate it and see Thank if you. it has implications for a broader system Thank across you. Ontario. Questions, the member from Haldeman Norfolk. To the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, I, I see agriculture is mentioned in the budget papers. It's on page 346, the last page, oh. explaining that after all these years, value-added agriculture is still being assessed at the high-tax industrial rate. Where is the of economic development? Rural natural gas expansion, other than expanding a tax on it. How are far-flung residents of rural Northern Ontario are going to deal with the new taxes and fees on home heating and gasoline. Now, further to action on climate change, six ministries now have a line item listed as Green Investment Fund initiatives, yep. but not a MAFRA. Farmers also want to help out on climate change. Why has the minister excluded farming from the Green Investment Fund? Question and thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the member this morning uh, from Haldeman North for, for asking the question about agriculture. I mean, we're very pleased that the finance minister uh, mentioned uh, agriculture several times uh, throughout his uh, budget speech that he delivered last Thursday. Uh, we do know uh, that farmers across the province of Ontario, 52,000 family farms, over 30,000 of them are involved in voluntary environment farm plants. They will be a significant player as this government reaches its targets of GHGs. We know that, that Don McCabe, the president of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, we look forward to uh, take, taking those investments that will be generated through our auction of credits to put back into agriculture, which is leading the way, a real leader in Ontario's economy today, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, here's something else we do know. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs has cut his budget by yep. close to $28 million. Oh, yep. That's a $28 million cut to one of the smallest wow. ministries. How will this budget cut help farms, agribusiness, who are not getting their requested farm industrial rate for electricity? 
How will this budget cut help employers, employees who did not request the added cost, fees, and taxes on agribusiness? Speaker, the agriculture minister cut his budget from $943 million to $916 million, close to a $28 million cut on this minister's watch. Why is this? We we know he's not renewing the $10 million local food fund. What other ag and food program uh, this Sir, can I, when I'm planning? The Deputy House Leader is warned. You have uh, one wrap up for your question. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. We know you're not renewing the $10 million local food fund. What other ag and food programs will this minister now be eliminating? Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the supplementary, uh, just to provide some education to my friend from Holland and Norfolk. Yeah. The Green Food Fund has been moved over to the Greenbelt Foundation, and the Green Foundation, of course, will be used to fund those projects that are just so important to distribute uh, a local food in the province of the Ontario. The member from Huron, Bruce, With come regards, to order. I would think the member should take the time to read the budget. The Green Investment Fund is just one tool to help businesses transition to lower GHG emissions right across the province of Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, the proof is in the number. The member from I have the Bruce opportunity Gray, back Sound, in 2006 time. to look at the Tory A budgets. From 1995 to 2003, they cut them every year and closed 32 ag offices. I'm standing. I uh, remind the minister, when I stand, you sit. The second thing is, no, I'm, I'm not finished yet. I still have some other people I have to get. The member from here on Bruce, second time. And uh, if it continues these shots back and forth, I'll go. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier. Members of the NDP have repeatedly raised in this chamber the ongoing and appalling mercury exposure experienced by the Grassinero First Nation people. In 2012, the Premier said she would rebuild the relationship to the community. Yet, in 2014, Elder Steve Forbisher, the former chief of Grassinero's First Nation, went on a hunger strike right here on the front lawn. Then again, this government said they would act. But right now, as we speak, Speaker, the community feels that they have to appeal to the United Nations for help. Speaker, my question is simple. When will the people of Gracineros have safe drinking water? Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you for that question. We take the issues at Grassy and Arrows, the mercury uh, uh, pollution, very seriously. I met with uh, Chief Fobuster last uh, summer and had a very detailed conversation with him about this issue. I have been to Grassy and Arrows to speak with the chief and his community and tour the area. As a result of that, we've set up a number of uh, uh, working groups. We are working with the federal and the First Nation partners to uh, make real progress in dealing with this. In particular, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs represents the, pro the province on the Ontario Grassy Narrows Nation Working Group. It's a cross-ministry team. It consists of members of the Ministry of Health and the members of the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change. We've also engaged with the new Answer. federal government, who is very anxious to work with the province and the Grassy Narrows to resolve this issue in a way that the federal Thank government you. has never participated in before. Thank you. Speaker, it has been half a century. The health effect of mercury poisoning is well known. They are horrific, and they are affecting so many people in Grassy Narrows. The residents of Grassy Narrows are Ontarians like you and I, Speaker. They deserve safe drinking water. They should not have to go to Geneva, Switzerland, and talk to the United Nations to gain respect for this basic human right. They live in Ontario. We are not a third world country. When will this government clean up the English Wabagoo River? When will they provide assistance to the people who live with the effect of mercury poisoning? And when 
Will they provide Question. the good people of Grassy Narrows with safe drinking water? Thank you. Minister. Thank you for that question. Um, one of the ways in which we're dealing with this problem is to uh, review the, how the Mercury Disability Board uh, works and how it conducts its uh, analysis of the problem, how it determines what assistance it's going to provide, and so on. I committed to Chief Fobister last summer that A, I would visit, and I did that, and as a result of that visit, we have uh, set up a process to review how the Mercury Disability Board goes about its work. We are engaging the best experts that we can. We are working with the Grassy Narrows First Nations. We are working with the relevant ministries in Ontario and now with the federal government. The vehicle of the Mercury Disability Board is one of the key Remember from Stormont, Dundas, South Ben Gary. deal with this problem by uh, looking Answer. at the effects of the poisoning and solutions. Hey, hey. Thank you. New question, the member from the Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, oh. Employment and Infrastructure. Minister, one of the issues that comes up the most at the doors in my community is the issue of our economy and jobs. And as you know, Minister, I have a business background, and so we've spent a lot of time talking with you and your staff about this issue and how we can grow our economy. Minister, last week we highlighted that we're on the heels of seven years of economic growth uh, in this province. We've seen over 600,000 jobs created wow. since the depths of the recession, and with a lot of growth coming forward in our economy, or anticipated in our economy. In last, in last week's budget, we are introducing measures to preserve and grow the economy, and we're doing things like making record investments in infrastructure, uh, reducing the, the regulatory burdens on businesses, and we're maintaining a low, low cor corporate tax environment that will continue to attract investment. These things benefit business, they benefit job creation, they benefit our economy, and they benefit the prosperity that the people of my Question. community enjoy. Uh, Minister, many of my constituents are excited about this, but they're also concerned about the volatility in the future. Could you please tell the House what we are doing to prepare Ontario's economy, Thank you. not only today but in the years ahead? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I appreciate the question. I also appreciate this member's advice on these issues. We're in a global race uh, to be more innovative, and we need to step it up. Our world is changing rapidly, Mr. Speaker, and we need to tap into the best global talent to ensure we succeed in an increasingly competitive global environment. This talent is already available here in Ontario. Our government in this budget is focusing on the fast-paced innovation economy with significant new investments in everything from quantum computing to advanced manufacturing to clean tech, biotech and automotive innovation. We're doubling down with a new business growth initiative, committing $400 million over five years to build on our investments in that talent, to scale up our smaller businesses, to drive innovation and to make Ontario the easiest place in the world to do business. Mr. Speaker, some yes, of this is economic. Some of this involves our infrastructure initiatives. A lot of it is with the leadership of our great Thank minister you. of research and innovation. Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister. Uh, investing in our economy and ensuring businesses have the tools they need to grow and to create jobs is critical to the future of our province, so I'm glad to hear the Minister's answer. But we can't just focus on reducing burdens in one particular sector and another. I think one of the conversations I have with the constituents in my riding of Etobicoke Centre a lot, what people are, are understanding is that to be competitive in a new economy, uh, we have to invest in supporting highly skilled job creation, that we have to support R&D, uh, innovation, and helping businesses not only start up but actually scale up and bring Remember their products to the global East, market. Stony Creek, uh, time. We don't want to see Ontario's talent leave and travel to the Silicon Valley or Europe or Asia uh, to start a business. We want them to do it right here in Ontario, Speaker. Yes, Speaker, through you to the Minister, uh, can you give me some concrete examples of initiatives aimed at fostering innovation and growing to prepare Ontario to succeed on a global scale? Good question. Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, it's very obvious by the Minister's com or the member's comments, Mr. Speaker, that he really gets it, and, and it's great to see. Uh, the the member points out, what the member points out is absolutely crucial to our, uh, our province, and that's why, Mr. Speaker, our business growth initiative uh, includes a number of new initiatives, and I'll share a couple of them with you. A new voucher system to help smaller, uh, high-growth firms access services like market research, testing, export development, and re research opportunities. A commitment to open up government procurement to provide a platform for made in Ontario innovation and technology, something our smaller firms, Mr. Speaker, have been looking for for some time. A Centre for Regulatory Excellence, which will help cut unnecessary red tape in the most powerful 
unprecedented way to date, Mr. Speaker, and a strategic yes, office, sir. Mr. Speaker, a strategic investment office that will attract investment to Ontario and help fund commercialization opportunities, Mr. Speaker. These Thank are you. just a few of many initiatives that were. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. Where I come from, talk is cheap, and promises are only as good as the politicians who make them. In the two years since the Premier made a pre-election visit to Kitchener to promise all-day two-way GO service within five years, a promise the Transportation Minister admitted was aspirational in nature, we've had nothing but talk. The 2016 budget provides the latest example, full of shout-outs to Kitchener-Waterloo transit enhancements without once indicating timelines for project completions. Just more talk. No Speaker, plan. a budget is where governments list their detailed spending plans and timelines, and yet all we get is talk. Will the Premier tell us why the people of Kitchener should believe her promise on all-day two-way go when it didn't even make its way into the budget? They really Mr. Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for his question. I uh, want to begin by saying, of course, uh, Budget 2016, in fact, Speaker, in many respects, is fundamentally about how important it is for us to build this province up by investing billions of dollars in infrastructure, in transit and transportation infrastructure, both in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area and beyond, Speaker, in communities like Kitchener-Waterloo. Speaker, I should also mention that it's because of MPPs like the member from Kitchener Centre and the member from Cambridge and this Premier and this Finance Minister that, Speaker, this government is going to get it right. We are getting it right. That member knows that in April of last year, Premier Kathleen Wynne announced that we'd invest $13.5 billion over the next decade to transform the GO Rail network on all seven of our corridors, Speaker. And that member, again, consistently has voted against budget after budget after budget that will help his own community. Thanks very much, Speaker. Unbelievable. Well, Speaker, the talk continues. Chief, after waiting, talk. You can risk. Supplementary, please. After waiting two years for promised essential GO improvements and getting little more than talk, Kitchener residents are still left waiting for the train. We've grown weary watching government transit expansions go forward elsewhere while we're stuck at the back of the bus. Speaker, we were hoping the budget would provide new direction, but instead, we saw new ways to tax us with no timelines on our local transit needs. Zero. Yet, one day later, Kitchener Center MPP tried to make amends, telling CTV there will be a very substantial announcement on all day two way go Question. before the summer. Speaker, will the Premier please tell us what was so substantial about this supposed announcement that it didn't make its way into the budget? Ah. Thank you. Speaker, well, Speaker, I, I, I relish questions like this because, of course, this Premier and this government and the member from Kitchener Centre and everybody on this side of the chamber understands why it's important for us to invest the money to make sure, to invest the billions of dollars to make sure that we build the province up, that we expand GO Transit, that we build highways and roads and bridges and so much more, Speaker. And I think it might be helpful, maybe even a little bit instructive, for that member who's asked us for this question, Speaker, to stroll on down to the front bench and ask his leader, Patrick Brown, why in more than in almost 10 years... Unless it's a uh, unless it's a point of order, uh, question period is over, and uh, the uh, member for Kitchener Conestoga on a point of order. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, pursu uh, pursuant to Standing Order 99D, written questions are to be answered within 24 sessional days. I have yet to receive answers on two overdue questions submitted to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, as, as well as the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. There is one.
I would, uh, I would refer to the, minister, the deputy house leader uh, to remind uh, you that you are required under the standing order 99D to file a response within 24 sessional days. Uh, your response now uh, for one of the questions is now overdue, and I would ask that you give the House some indication of what your response would be in forthcoming, and that would be answered, that would be answered to uh, question 485. In the same point of order, we'd be pleased to uh, take this under advisement and act at the earliest possible opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Agriculture, a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a point of order, if I might be able to correct my record this morning in response to a, a response to the member from Haldeman, Norfolk. I ask that legislative research do a review for me in 2006 on the agricultural budgets from the Progressive Conservative Government. Thank you. Uh, the date is all that's needed. When you correct your record, you don't make any other statements other than to, to correct your record. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.